welcome back again. Uh, today, we want to talk about uh, two attempts at trying to discern how God can be one, and yet the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being equally God. Uh, as we saw in our previous sessions, uh, the apologist, Justin Martyr, attempted to do this. Uh, he saw God uh, as one, the Father embodying the whole of the Godhead, but he had what he called the inner word, the inner word, the word in God's mind. And that inner word uh, became distinct, had a distinct subjectivity. He became a distinct person within the economy of salvation, that is, in creation and redemption. Uh, and so the Trinity wasn't the Trinity from all eternity in this sense. It was sort of in embryo or in, in thought, uh, but only became truly, the Son only became truly who he is uh, when, in, when the Father created through him and redeemed the world through him as well. Uh, it was an attempt, but it wasn't uh, really a, 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 an attempt that fully explained or was accurate. Um, but just a martyr was doing the best he could uh, in trying to refute those who wanted to deny Christianity. We saw in Irenaeus a much more fuller expression of the Trinity. And the reason was he was less philosophical and more biblical uh, the, than the apologists, such as Justin Martyr. Uh, he saw God the Father being the Father, uh, that therefore the Father would have always a Son. And the Father and the Son were distinct. Uh, the Father was the Father and the Son was the Son. And he saw the Holy Spirit as the one who sanctified us and helped us be recreated into the image of the Son. And so he had a very much more vibrant sense of the Trinity, that God was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But one of the things that Irenaeus did not do was try to explain or conceive, well, how? How do we conceive? How do we understand? How do we say uh, that God is one, and yet the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being all equally God? Well, in the latter part of the uh, second century, third century, uh, there were other things going on as well. And these, what was going on, later theologians spoke of as monarchianism. Uh, monarchianism was uh, the notion of wanting to protect uh, the oneness of God with people like uh, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and, and other people uh, speaking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, these people were concerned <clears throat> about maintaining the oneness. They thought, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and giving them their own identities. Do we end up with three gods? Well, we can't end up with three gods. And so they were worried about having three gods and sort of wanted to walk back some on how we understand how God could be one and preserve the oneness of God. Now, there were two forms of what is called monarchianism. One form of monarchianism uh, <clears throat> was adoptionism. Uh, and as the term uh, intimates, intimates, is that Jesus was the adopted son of the Father. Now, this has a long history. Uh, it goes back, obviously, at the time to the time of Jesus, where uh, the Jews found it very difficult because of their belief in one God, how God could have a son. Uh, and, and because to God, for God to have a son seemed to imply that you had one God who was the Father, and another God who was the Son. Well, some of those who uh, wanted to become Christians, and probably in a way were Christians, 
in order to preserve the oneness of God, spoke of Jesus being the adopted Son of God. And those early, early adoptionists, Jewish adoptionists, were called Ebionites. Uh, we believe they were called Ebionites because they were founded by a guy by the name of Ebion uh, way back in the early church towards the, uh, in the second century. Uh, and they, again, uh, also uh, did not believe that he was born of virgin birth because that kind of implied if he was born, conceived and born, conceived by the Holy Spirit, uh, then you're, we're, we're talking again, uh, the Holy Spirit and, and the Son being separate gods from the Father. And so they, they thought of Jesus as being a normal human being, but that he was anointed at baptism by the Holy Spirit. And through this anointing at baptism through the Holy Spirit, uh, he became uh, the Father's Son. But he wasn't the Father's Son from all eternity, he became uh, an adopted son, sort of like, like you and you, you and I, or the prophets receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, they were adopted in that sense. So Jesus was not in any way divine, different from the way you and I would be sons of God. He may be in a degree better son because he had more of the Holy Spirit, but he wasn't truly different from the prophets or other holy holy people. Uh, again, this got developed later on in Rome in 190. There was a fellow by the name of Theod uh, Theodotus, uh, the leather merchant. Uh, we, they call him the leather merchant to, to distinguish him, who was another sort of theologian, who was a banker and called Theodotus the banker. Now, we, we don't have to worry about the banker or the merchant, but anyway, he had that name. Uh, but he brought adoptionism to Rome. And again, he, he uh, wanted to hold or held uh, that again at baptism, only at baptism did the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus. And because he descended upon Jesus, Jesus became the Son and therefore was empowered to uh, work miracles and and uh, you know the other great deeds that Jesus did. Well, Theodotus the banker, uh, he was condemned by Pope uh, Victor, uh, who reigned as Pope from 186 to 198. So again, it was very easy to see that this adoptionism uh, was an heretical kind of way of dealing with the problem of, of the one God and yet trying to give some special status to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Now, the most enterprising uh, of the adoptionists and who had, in a sense, the most developed uh, uh, form of adoption was a fellow by the name of Paul of Samosata. He was bishop of Antioch uh, from 260 to 268. Uh, and uh, he, again, was wrestling with this problem of wanting to uphold the oneness of God. And so he said that the Father, Son, and Spirit were not equally God. As a matter of fact, he would say the Father is God alone. He alone is the one God. Jesus, as the Son, is a mere man. And the Holy Spirit is the grace poured out upon the believers from the Holy Spirit. Now, what is fascinating about Paul of San Masada, he made a distinction between the Word of God and the Son of God. The Word of God was from all eternity within the mind of God. He the Word of God expressed all the divine knowledge that resided in God the Father from all eternity. Jesus was born as a mere man, all right? But again, at baptism, 
the Father sent his word, the word that was in him from all eternity, upon the mere man Jesus, and by sending the word of God upon the mere man Jesus, that man Jesus became God's son. He was adopt adopted as the Father's son. And so again, we have this situation where uh, Jesus is son of God, not in a way different from the prophets or us, but he was just more so because the Father poured upon him more of his knowledge and more of his word. But also you see here that the word itself was not a distinct subject, having its own distinct identi divine identity, but was merely the thought that resided within God. And so not only was the incarnation undermined, that the Son of God actually became man, but the Trinity itself was undermined because really God was simply one and the Word of God was not distinct, a distinct subject or person from him, but really the intellectual thought of God, the Father that resided within him. Now, uh, Paul of San Masada uh, obviously got into trouble, and he was condemned at the Council of Antioch um, in 268, where the Council of Antioch upheld both that the Son was truly a distinct subject, a divine person distinct from the Father, and that the Word, too, was the same as the Son, the Word and the Son expressed the two, part, two aspects of, of, of Jesus' Sonship, that being the Son of God, he contains all of the Father's Word, all of the Father's truth, and the Father and the Son, as well as the Holy Spirit, were distinct, had distinct identities and subjects. Uh, but, it, but the problem was, as is becoming clear, is how we uphold the distinctiveness of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet be able to say that God is one. That issue is yet to be fully, uh, in a sense, explored and answered properly. All right? Now, also in the third century, you had another form of monarchianism. And this was much more appealing. It didn't take much for Christians to... Uh, uh, faithful Christians will say, well, adoptionism just doesn't work. I mean, Jesus was not an adopted son of God. He was the son of God by nature, and that son of God actually did become man. And so adoptionism never really, in a sense, caught on. Uh, it was sort of a dead end to begin with. Well, all heresies are dead ends, but uh, this one died quicker than, <laughs> quicker than some. Uh, but one that, that had, had more appeal was what was called modalistic monarchianism. Now, we'll explain what it means to be modalistic in a minute here, uh, but also goes by the name of Sibelianism because uh, a theologian uh, by the name of Sibelius was the most ardent promoter of this form of understanding the Trinity, and he had the most appeal and had gotten the most publicity uh, in the midst of, uh, midst of all of this. Now, modalism, or wanted to uphold, they truly wanted to uphold the divinity of the Son and simultaneously the oneness of God. This is obviously the issue. How can you say the Son is God as simultaneously saying that God is one? All right? so that you don't end up with, with two different gods, one being the Father and one being the Son. Well, in the early stages, uh, with someone like a fellow by the name of Noetus of Smyrna, who lived at the end of the second century, uh, he spoke of the Father and the Son, the Father, in a sense, uh, expressed himself in a son-like way within the humanity of Jesus. And so what we have here is God the Father being able to sort of mold himself 
into a son-like manner so as in the incarnation uh, we, we, what, we, what what appears is God expressing himself in the manner of a son. Now, again, it's Sibelius who developed this idea and brought it to Rome in the third century. And one of the problems was is that the popes at the time were well aware of the problem. And they sort of thought that maybe Sibelius's understanding might do the trick. Uh, but in the end, uh, they realized, after I think they became more aware of the implications and, and what was going on, that this was not going to work. And so uh, while you had Pope Zephyrinus and Pope Callistus, in a sense, looking favorably at first upon what Sibelius had to say, Pope Callistus, even though he in the end was accused of being a Sibelian himself because he was, he was friends with Sibelius, in the end, uh, Callistus uh, excommunicated uh, Sibelius for his teaching. But what does Sibelius say? Now this is, uh, at first sight, this can seem to be quite appealing. Uh, he, uh, he held that God was one. Uh, he used the term monad, meaning oneness. There's just a oneness about God. However, when God, the one God, wanted to act within the created order, as in the act of creation or the act of redemption or in the act of sanctification, he was able to change his mode, and this is where, where the word modalism comes into play. He was able to, ex, to change his mode of appearance depending on how he wanted to be perceived within the uh, order of creation. And so the one God molded himself into the appearance of the Father when he created the world. So he appeared as a father in the work of creation. In one sense, that would make sense. Fathers create. So God took on the appearance of the father when he brought things into existence. When it came to redemption, God, the one God, now putting aside his appearance as father, molded himself into the appearance of the son. And so as, as a, in, under the appearance of son, he became man and redeemed us. Also then, in the Holy Spirit, he molded himself to appear like the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. And so the one God, it's sort of like God is Plato or Putty. He keeps molding himself into various images depending on how he wants to appear, wants to appear. Or, uh, Sibelius doesn't use this example, but uh, an example that I came up with that I think would, would it's, like, it's like the molecule H2O. Depending on the temperature, the molecule H2O can be water, or it can be steam, or it can be ice. You can mold, in a sense, H2O into three different types. Well, that's what, what Sibelius saw God doing. The problem was, and this is why he is condemned, is that the persons of the Trinity do not have any distinct identities in themselves. You have the one God, but you really don't have a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You just have the... God appearing to be a father, then appearing to be the son, and then appearing to be the Holy Spirit. Uh, but God himself is not father, son, and Holy Spirit. And so he was condemned for not being true to scripture and to tradition where, yes, there's one God, but the father is the really father, the son is really the son, and the Holy Spirit is really the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, the theologian Tertullian made mockery and fun of this whole idea. He said, imagine Jesus the Son is praying to the Father. So when Jesus prays, he has his Son hat on. Well, then after Jesus prays, 
that God has to put on his father hat in order to receive the son's prayer. And then if he answers the son, he's got to take off his father hat and put back on his sonship hat. And so you had this, you know, this, this going back and forth of God being God the Father, God being Father, Father, God the Son. And if he sends the Holy Spirit, so then he's got to turn himself into the Holy Spirit. He said, this is all ridiculous. You know, God can't do this hat trick sort of thing of pretending to be Father one second, the Son the second, and the Holy Spirit the third. But you see here, again, the problem, how can we preserve the truth of the gospel that the one God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit without either getting us into the heresy of adoptionism where Jesus really isn't the truly the Son of God or get yourself in the heresy of modalism where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit don't really exist at all. We will uh, address this more fully as we go on. It will remain a mystery but we will become clear. The church will become absolutely clear what the mystery is, even though we can't fully comprehend it. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you and watch over you. And may the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one God, watch over you and keep you safe. Amen. Mm -hmm.